Welcome to Mysteries Abound, a collection of stories about the unusual, the strange, the perplexing, and the downright odd. In our world today, Mysteries Abound. Welcome everyone, this is the Mysteries Abound podcast and I'm your host Paul. This is episode 53 and this show is entitled Attack of the Nazi Talking Dogs. It's been a few weeks since the last podcast, whether it be Origins, Bizarre, Bizarre or Mysteries Abound, because here in Australia it's been a couple of weeks of school holidays and when my wife's home I don't get much of a chance to record because she's usually finding me great little jobs to do around the place. This time it was the last thing we had to do from repairing from the flood and it was the painting of the nine bedroom cupboard doors. Anyway, that's in the past. She's back at work this week and I can get back to doing my podcasts. Our first story comes from the paranormal.about.com website. It's entitled The Real X-Men and it's written by Stephen Wagner. They have powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men or women. But unlike the characters of the comic book, these extraordinary people were quite real. The X-Men movies were huge hits in the theatres. Based on the enormously popular comic book series, X-Men features a collection of human mutants, both good and evil, who were born with extraordinary and sometimes bizarre powers. With such names as Wolverine, Storm, Cyclops, Magneto and Mystique, they bound around making blades spring from their knuckles, conjuring hurricanes from the sky, or manipulating their environment through telekinesis. These characters, creations of legendary comic book author and illustrator Stan Lee, live only in the imagination, on paper and on film. Would you believe there are real X-Men? They may not be genetic mutants in the strictest sense, and they may not be able to threaten or save the world with their strange and fantastic powers of the body and mind, but they are extraordinary, not at all like you and me. Here's our own gallery of real-life, super-powered characters. Lightning Man When storm clouds gather, courageous Lightning Man stands in defiance of nature to draw deadly bolts of electricity from the heavens. Roy Cleveland Sullivan was a forest ranger in Virginia who had an incredible attraction to lightning, or rather, it had an attraction to him. Over his 36-year career as a ranger, Sullivan was struck by lightning seven times and survived each jolt, but not unscathed. When struck for the first time in 1942, he suffered the loss of a nail on his big toe. 27 years passed before he was struck again, this time by a bolt that singed his eyebrows off. The next year, in 1970, another strike burned Sullivan's left shoulder. Now it looked as though lightning had it out for poor Roy, and people were starting to call him the human lightning rod. Roy didn't disappoint them. Lightning zapped him again in 1972, setting his hair on fire, and convincing him to keep a container of water in his car just in case. The water came in handy in 1973 when seemingly just to taunt Sullivan, a low-hanging cloud shot a bolt of lightning at his head, blasting him out of the car, setting his hair on fire and knocking off a shoe. The sixth strike in 1976 injured his ankle and the seventh strike in 1977 got him when he was fishing and put him in hospital for treatment of chest and stomach burns. Lightning may not have been able to kill Roy Sullivan, but perhaps the threat of it did. He took his own life in 1983. Two of his lightning-singed ranger hats are on display at the Guinness World Exhibit Halls. Beastmaster. With just the power of his mind, he can command animals to do his bidding. 
Vladimir Durov was no ordinary animal trainer. As a veteran performer in a Russian circus, he claimed to use a remarkable method for communicating with his canine co-workers. Through telepathy. Professor W. Bekterev, head of the Institute for Investigation of the Brain in St. Petersburg, decided to test Durov's claim. Bekterev created a list of tasks that he wanted one of Durov's dogs to perform in a specific order without any time for training. After hearing or reading the list of tasks, Durov went to his fox terrier, Picky, took his head in his hands and stared straight into the little dog's eyes, psychically transferring his thoughts directly into Picky's brain. Durov released the dog and it immediately went about performing the assigned tasks. Thinking that perhaps Durov was giving the dog subtle clues with his eyes, the test was repeated with a new set of tasks, but this time Durov was blindfolded. Picky still responded to his psychic commands. The Electromagneto Team Charged like superconducting human batteries, they roam the countryside thrilling all they meet with the electrifying power at their fingertips. There have been several documented cases of people who apparently possess inexplicable electromagnetic properties. For just a 10-week period in 1846, 14-year-old French girl Angelique Coton's mere presence made the needles of compasses spin wildly. Objects as heavy as furniture would slide away from her if she tried to touch them. Objects near her would vibrate unnaturally. Jenny Morgan of Sedalia, Missouri could emit highly charged sparks from her fingertips that were strong enough to knock people unconscious. Animals would shun her. After an 18-month undiagnosed illness, Canadian teenager Caroline Clare became so magnetised that metal objects like forks and knives stuck to her skin. The force was so powerful that another person was required to pull them off. Inga Gaiduchenko, a 14-year-old Soviet student, was also highly magnetic. Before members of the Moscow Technological Institute, she showed how spoons and pens stuck to her hands. Even non-metallic objects such as china plates and books were also affected. The Amazing Kinetotron With her thoughts alone, a steely glance or a subtle gesture, she can move inanimate objects at will. Nina Kulagina became one of the most famous psychics in the Soviet Union in the 1960s because of her amazing feats of telekinesis or psychokinesis. In films smuggled out of the country, Kulagina was shown to be able to move small objects placed before her on a table. Under close scientific observation, Kulagina would hold her hands a few inches above the objects, and in a few moments they would begin to slide across the table. Wooden matches, small boxes, cigarettes and plexiglass would all react to her intense concentration. At times, objects would continue to move even when she took her hands away. In the early 1970s, Kulagina was even recruited by the Soviet government to see if she could somehow help a sick Nikita Khrushchev. Pyro Elastoman Watch him stretch his body to incredible lengths and handle red-hot flaming embers in his bare hands. Daniel Dundas Holm was either one of the most incredible psychic mediums of the mid-1800s or one of the era's cleverest magicians. The feats this Scotsman performed at close range outstanded the elite and royalty of his day. In one demonstration, he entered his usual trance state and announced he was in touch with the guardian spirit that was very tall and strong. While being watched by two witnesses who flanked him, Holm shot up an additional six inches in height and it could be clearly seen that his slippered feet were planted flatly on the floor. Holm could also hold burning embers in his bare hands, completely without harm, a feat he performed on a number of occasions. 
Sir William Crookes of the British Society for Psychical Research once saw Home pick up a hot coal as big as an orange and hold it nonchalantly in both hands. Home even blew on the coal until it became white hot and flames flickered around his bare fingers. Crooks then inspected Holmes' hands and affirmed that they did not appear to be specially treated in any way and showed absolutely no sign of blistering, scarring or burning. Crooks remarked in fact that Holmes's hands were as soft and delicate as a woman's. In yet another performance, Holmes floated out of a second story window, paused, then floated back inside to the utter astonishment of three witnesses on the ground. The Incredible X-Ray There's no hiding evil deeds from the Incredible X-Ray, whose penetrating X-Ray vision sees all. Kodabox, a stage performer who billed himself as the man with the X-Ray eyes, astonished audiences in the early 1900s. Box first allowed audience members to completely blind him by putting coins over his eyes and fastening them in place with adhesive tape. His entire head was then bandaged in cloth, assuring everyone that he could see nothing. He then proceeded to read messages that audience participants had written on paper. He could also read books and accurately describe objects held up by members of the audience. With his elaborate blindfold in place, Box once even safely rode a bicycle through the busy traffic of New York's Times Square. Microscopo and Telescopic Like superpowered human scientific instruments, this heroic duo uses their fantastic vision to see microscopic details or great distances. Two gentlemen might share the title of Microscopo, both having the ability to distinguish vinyl phonograph records merely by looking at the grooves with their unaided eyes. Alva Mason first demonstrated this talent in the 1930s, and more recently, Arthur Lintgen, a resident of Philadelphia, proved to none other than the amazing Randy that he could do the same thing. Veronica Sider, a German dentist, apparently had telescopic vision. In several demonstrations, she showed that she could identify people from more than a mile distance. Sider also claimed that she could see the individual red, green and blue dots that make up the picture on a colour television set. And finally, Medictron the healer. With the unknown force emanating from his miraculous hands, Medictron has the power to heal all forms of injuries and maladies. John D. Reese of Youngstown, Ohio, never studied medicine. In fact, it wasn't until he was about 30 years old that Reese discovered his remarkable, if latent, power to heal. One day in 1887, an acquaintance of Mr. Reese had fallen from a ladder and seriously injured his spine. A severe spinal strain, his physician called it. Reese, for some reason, ran his fingers up and down the man's back, immediately after which the man announced that his pain had ceased entirely. He got up and went back to work. Reese likewise healed Hans Wagner, a shortstop for the Pittsburgh Pirates, who had been carried from the field with a back injury. He also instantly cured a politician whose hand and wrist became useless to him from so much handshaking. Doctors had told him he needed weeks and weeks of rest. After an encounter with Reese, he was perfectly fine. How do we explain the abilities of these astounding individuals? Are they conduits for some unimaginable interdimensional power? Are they merely tricksters and hoaxers? Or are they genetic mutants who, like the X-Men, might be forerunners of the future of the human race? was an ugly duckling with feathers all stubby and brown and the other birds in so many words said get out of town get out get out 
get out of town. And he went with a quack and a waddle and a quack in a flurry of hide and down. And now to something completely different. From the www.wildlifewarriors.org.au website, the black swan. I've chosen the black swan for this article because we currently have some visitors from the United Kingdom staying with my family and they were quite amazed to see our swans which are black, not white as they are in Europe. Australia is one of the driest continents in the world, with only a tiny proportion of the country providing suitable habitat for waterbirds. One of the largest and most notable of these species is the Australian black swan. There are seven species of swan in the world today, five are white, and the remaining two are the black-necked swan of South America and the Australian black swan. There is an ancient belief that swans only sing when they are dying According to this legend, it is only then the mute swan becomes vocal and the legendary swan song becomes evident. This of course is a fairy tale and the black swan makes a number of different vocal sounds. Native to Australia, the black swan is most often seen on extensive shallow stretches of permanent water, including brackish and salt water. It prefers shallow water where it can reach the bottom of the water to feed. The black swan feeds mainly on aquatic plants and grasses. The flight formation of black swans as they take to the skies is spectacular, in part due to their size, but also due to the sight from the ground as they fly in a V formation with their necks outstretched. The Australian black swan was first discovered on the west coast of Australia on what is now known as the Swan River by the Dutch in the year 1697. They eventually took three live swans back home with them. After breeding, which takes place from February to September, black swans get together in enormous flocks, sometimes in many thousands, to gather to molt. They nest in a heap of vegetable matter on the water and the cygnets are grey-brown in colour. The males are much larger than the females, whose bills and irises are much lighter than the males. They both have a high-pitched bugle noise, which they emit even in flight. If you want to catch a cryptid doing its thing in America, common sense would deem you drive far out into the woods where humankind rarely ventures. After all, it's typically hunters and hikers who wind up having awkward run-ins with Bigfoot or the Flatwoods monster. But city dwellers who want a taste of the supernatural ought not to despair. A deep riffling through the musky archives of American folklore reveal several beasties who have given up their woodsy pad for the fast-paced life of the big city. See what monsters could be dealing with condo fees and long lines at Starbucks in the gallery below. And this article comes from the www.theatlanticcities.com website and it's written by John Midcalf. And if you visit the show notes at www.origins.info and click on the Mysteries Abound show notes link, and then on the link to episode 53, and then of course the link to this article. There is a slideshow from which this text has come. The Kansas City Beeman The Kansas City Beeman is said to be a kind of Sasquatch, like the one supposedly seen in this photo from Elk County, Pennsylvania. The legend is that a circus train derailed in 1904 disgorging a 12-foot-tall gorilla that later bred with forest creatures, perhaps wolves, to become the beeman. Hmm, sounds plausible. The Sarasota Skunk Ape The skunk ape or booger terrorised Florida in the 1960s and 70s. It is said to stand upright and smell just awful. Skeptics theorise it is an escaped orangutan. The Detroit Nain Rouge 
This tiny red dwarf is the source of all of Detroit's historical woes, including its depressed economy, some folks believe. Sporting red eyes and rotten teeth, the name Rouge allegedly appeared before the 1763 Battle of Bloody Run and 1967's 12th Street Riot. Nightclub patrons caught it in 1996, running away from a car break-in while wearing a really nasty torn fur coat. The Goatman of Washington, D.C. This federal agricultural scientist was the victim of an experiment on goats gone horribly wrong. Nowadays, the goat man roams the DC area, attacking victims with an axe. However, he might also just be a crazy old hermit who lives in the woods, as per one report. Wait, another goatman. This goatman of Lake Worth resides in Fort Worth, Dallas chilling in a lake while grooming its scales and horns. It's also eviscerated the occasional sheep. Local author Sally Ann Clark bumped into the creature in 1969 and said it went grrr, brr, eep, you, and sounded almost as if it would cry any minute from the great pain that it was in. The Lake Champlain Monster Champy, the happy plesiosaur, was the original Loch Ness Monster, first spotted in Lake Champlain in 1883 by a sheriff who described a giant water serpent with white spots inside its mouth. P.T. Barnum later put up a $50,000 bounty on its snake-like head. Today, Champy serves as the mascot for the Vermont Lake Monsters, a minor league baseball team in Burlington, Vermont. Seattle Bat Squatch. As seen in this highly believable photograph of Mount Rainier, the Bat Squatch is a purple pterodactyl created in MS paint. It began circulating in the Seattle area folklore after the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. Liquor store owner Butch Whitaker observed it in 1994, though it was no biggie. He said, I'm not surprised, these things happen to me all the time. The Mole People of New York City Shuffling, nearly blind homeless people are said to live in the steam and dust-filled tunnels of New York's MTA, subsisting on large rats they call raccoons. Jennifer Toff described her dealings with this subterranean race in her 1993 book, The Mole People, saying most were crazy or drug addicted. Many of Toff's claims have been disputed but filmmaker Mark Singer verified at least one underground shantytown in the 2000 documentary Dark Days. Boston's Dover Demon Witnesses spotted this unhealthy looking specimen in 1977 climbing a wall near a bar in Dover, 15 miles southwest of Boston. Newspapers that carried the drawing you see here told of a hairless beast with a watermelon-sized head, orange eyes and no mouth. Oh, and it squawked like a hawk snake. And the comment made here by Ernest Payne is quite appropriate when looking at this article. Makes me glad I live in Canada, now where the only urban dangers are foxes, raccoons, skunks, bad urban planning, and rabid mares. Toronto, at least, for the last one. The Mona Lisa is one of the most enigmatic and iconic pieces of Western art. It has inspired countless copies, 
but one replica at the Madrid's Museo del Prado is generating its own buzz. Conservators say it was painted at the same time as the original, and possibly by one of the master's pupils, perhaps even a lover. From the www.npr.org website, the Mona Lisa's twin painting is discovered. Juxtaposing the two paintings and using infrared technology, which works like an X-ray, allowing one to see beneath the paint to see previous, obscured versions, conservators say that Leonardo and the painter of the replica made exactly the same changes at the same time. The changes mirrored the changes which Leonardo made on the original, the Martin Bailey correspondent with the art newspaper in London tells NPR's Melissa Block. Conservators concluded that the two pictures had been done side by side in the studio and it was probably on easels which were two or three yards away from each other. The copy brings da Vinci's studio to life and stirs up questions. Who was this mystery painter? According to Bailey, the artist is likely to have been one of Leonardo's main assistants, Melzi or Soleil, who was rumoured to have been da Vinci's lover. Side by side, the pictures look noticeably different. The copy is significantly brighter and more colourful, and even Mona Lisa's famous coy smile takes on a new cast. The original Mona Lisa in the Louvre is difficult to see. It's covered with layers of varnish, which has darkened over the decades and the centuries, and even cracked, Bailey says. What is wonderful about the copy is how vivid it is, and you see Lisa in a quite different light. I thought her eyes were enticing. And you see her enigmatic smile in a way that you don't quite get in the original. Bailey says the find will be relevant to historians and lay people, in that, paradoxically, a copy might bring viewers to the original with fresh eyes. It is, after all, the world's most famous painting. But people don't look at it fresh, he says. They look at it almost as an icon. If you go to the Louvre, people aren't actually really looking at the painting. They just want to be in the same room with it. For me, the beauty of the copy is that it actually makes us look at the painting as a painting, and I hope it will have that effect on other people too. From 1757 to 1775, Ben Franklin lived in an elegant four-storey Georgian house at No. 36 Craven Street in London during his time as an ambassador for the American colonies. In late 1998, a group calling itself Friends of Benjamin Franklin House began to convert the dilapidated building into a museum to honour Franklin whose other home in Philadelphia had been raised in 1812 to make way for new construction. A ghost house frame now sits on the site. One month into the renovations, a construction worker named Jim Field was working in the basement when he found something odd. A small pit was in a windowless basement room. Inside, sticking out of the dirt floor, was a human thigh bone. From the mentalfloss.com website, an article by Matt Soniak. That time they found those bodies in Ben Franklin's basement. The police were called and supervised excavation continued. More human bones were pulled up, and more, and more, until some 1,200 pieces of bone were recovered. Initial examinations revealed that the bones were the remains of ten bodies, six of them children, and were a little more than 200 years old. Their age discouraged any interest from Scotland Yard, but piqued the curiosity of historians and the Institute of Archaeology. The bones' age meant that they have been buried in the basement around the same time that Franklin was living in the house. Did America put a serial killer on the $100 bill? Almost certainly not. Continued study of the bones revealed that some of the bones had been sawed through. Others bore the marks of a scalpel. 
a few of the skulls had been drilled into. The evidence pointed not to murder by Franklin, but anatomical study by his friend William Hewson. Hewson had been a student of the anatomist William Hunter until the two had a falling out and Hewson broke away to continue his studies on his own. Anatomy was still in its infancy, but the day's social and ethical mores frowned upon it. A steady supply of human bones was hard to come by legally, so Hewson, Hunter and the field's other pioneers had to turn to grave robbing either paying professional resurrection men to procure cadavers or digging them up themselves to get their hands on specimens. Researchers think that 36 Craven was an irresistible spot for Hewson to establish his own anatomy lab. The tenant was a trusted friend, the landlady was his mother-in-law, and he was flanked by convenient sources for corpses. Bodies could be smuggled from graveyards and delivered to the wharf at one end of the street or snatched from the gallows at the other end. When he was done with them, Hewson simply buried whatever was left of the bodies in the basement, rather than sneak them out for disposal elsewhere and risk getting caught and prosecuted for dissection and grave robbing. How involved was Franklin then? Well, no one knows for sure. As far as the friends of Benjamin Franklin House will speculate, Franklin could have known what was going on in the house, but didn't participate. He was, after all, more interested in physics than medicine. It's also possible that he wasn't using the house during the dissections and had no idea this was happening. The friends have found some evidence that Franklin let Hewson have use of the whole house for a while and lived up the street with the landlady during that time. The year that Franklin left England and returned to North America, Hewson fell victim to his scientific pursuits, accidentally cutting himself while dissecting a putrid body and dying from an infection. And whilst we're visiting the Mental Floss website, another article by Matt Soniak. Fusag, the ghost army of World War II. In the final years of World War II, both the Allied and Axis powers knew that there was no chance of defeating Hitler without cracking his grasp on Western Europe, and both sides knew that Northern France was the obvious target for an amphibious assault. The German High Command assumed the Allies would cross from England to France at the narrowest part of the Channel and land at Pas de Calais. The Allies instead set their sight some 200 miles to the west. The beaches of Normandy could be taken as they were, but if the Germans added to their defence by moving their reserve infantry and panzers to Normandy from their garrison in the Pas de Calais region, the invasion would be a disaster. Success, the Allies decided, would rest on distracting German forces and spreading them too thin across multiple invasion sites. They needed a way to credibly threaten Pas de Calais, scaring the Germans into keeping the reserves there and away from the actual battle. The resulting plan, Operation Fortitude, is one of the greatest lies ever told. The Allied intelligence services created two fake armies to keep the Germans on their toes. One would be based in Scotland for a supposed invasion of Norway and the other headquartered in southeast England to threaten Pas de Calais. The northern operation relied mainly on fake radio traffic and the feeding of false information to double agents to create the impression of a substantial army. Fortitude South, though, was well within the range of prying German ears and eyes, so fake chatter alone would be uncovered too quickly. The Allies would have to make it look and sound like a substantial army was building up in southeast England. They needed boots on the ground there, without actually using too much of their precious manpower. When intelligence officers learned that the 1st US Army Corps, or the FUSAG, was to be redesignated the 12th Army Group, they knew that they had their Pas de Calais invaders. The FUSAG was kept alive on paper, and the Phantom Army was given a few real soldiers and placed under the command of one of the era's great military leaders. General George S. Patton, nicknamed Old Blood and Guts, was feared and respected by Germans, more so than any other Allied commander. Today he's an American legend and a military icon, 
but in early 1944 he was almost out of a job. During the invasion of Sicily the previous summer, Patton had been visiting wounded troops at a field hospital when he came across Private Charles H. Cool, slouched on a stool and suffering from battle fatigue. When Patton asked him where he was injured, Cool explained that he wasn't wounded, but just couldn't take it. Patton didn't like the answer, so pulled out his gloves, slapped Cool across the face with them and literally kicked him out of the hospital tent with an order to return to the front line. A media firestorm followed, and Patton was deemed a public relations liability and relieved of his command. He spent the rest of the year hopping around the Mediterranean making speeches, inspecting facilities and having his picture taken with troops. When the Phantom Fusaga got its marching orders, General Dwight Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces, struck a deal with Patton. The General would take command of the fictional army and stay out of trouble. And when the US Third Army actually invaded France, he'd be given the reins. Patton's Ghost Army was based out of Dover, East Anglia and other areas of South East England. The choice of the location made it look like the Allies were going to push across the English Channel straight into the port of Calais, but also left the operation vulnerable to German snooping. To leave no doubt in Hitler's mind that Fusag was a formidable threat and that an attack on Calais was imminent, Allied intelligence launched a multi-pronged campaign of deception against the Germans. Throughout most of the war, the German intelligence service and military brass believed that the Allied command in Europe was crawling with German spies. In reality, the British had quickly rounded up most of the Nazi agents as they arrived in the UK and turned them into double agents. Two of the spies were instrumental during Fortitude. Roman Garby Zerniawoski, codenamed Brutus, was a former Polish military officer who pretended to spy for the Germans and convinced his Nazi handlers that he was a liaison between Free Polish Forces and Patton's FUSAG headquarters. Juan Pujol, codenamed Garbo, was a Spaniard who'd previously trolled the Germans on his own before being recruited by the Allies and put to work feeding fake info to the Nazis on FUSAG's manpower, manoeuvres and battle readiness. British intelligence also passed fake info off to Germany through civilian channels. For example, letters were printed in the local newspapers near FUSAG's supposed base, voicing complaints from citizens about the noise and the behaviour of the troops. On the ground in South East England, something also had to be done about the Germans' reconnaissance planes. There were a few real American and British units in the area, temporarily assigned to FUSAG before actually heading to Normandy, but the view from above was not impressive. The fake intelligence and chatter was creating the impression that FUSAG was larger than any other Allied army operating in Europe, so now it had to look real and like it meant business. To bring FUSAG off of paper and into the real world, the Allies built a cleverly conceived, sort of real but mostly fake base for the army. Mess tents, hospital tents, ammo caches, toilets, fuel depots and parking areas were built all over the southeast. The parking lots were filled with fake jeeps, trucks and tanks built from cloth and plywood. Inflatable rubber vehicles were also deployed, but frequently fell victim to curious cows from the local farms. Every night a group of soldiers was responsible for picking up and moving the fake vehicles around the bases for the sake of realism, one of them using a custom-made rolling tool to make tyre tracks in the dirt. The harbours of the area likewise had to be populated by a false navy and British movie industry pros were brought in to dress the set. They constructed landing craft, support boats and even an oil dock from wood and fabric and floated them on oil drums. As D-Day loomed, the Allied wonder if their ruse was working. The interception and decryption of German radio traffic aided by the well-timed arrival of a captured German code machine gave them a resounding yes the Germans were buying FUSAG and the Pas de Calais invasion hook, line and sinker, but the lie could not unravel just yet. On June the 6th, the Allies landed at Normandy. As the battle raged there and the Germans considered sending reinforcements, the Allies kept spinning the story, lest the panzers in Calais roll up behind the real Allied armies as they moved up and off the beaches. The waters around southern England were jammed with fake boats and even a few real battleships. The scripted radio traffic went silent, 
Smoke screens were laid, and boats swept the channel for mines, all to give the impression that another attack was imminent. Brutus and Garbo continued to mislead their German superiors, telling them that Normandy was just a distraction and Patton's army was going to embark in just a few days for the real invasion. On June 9, Garbo radioed into his German contacts and transmitted for a full two hours with false troop movement reports, descriptions of the landing forces and a reassurance that Fusag's true target was the Pas de Calais. The message went all the way up the chain to Hitler, who not only cancelled an order to send the Calais forces to Normandy, but actually rerouted reinforcements coming from other areas away from Normandy and to Calais. During the D-Day landings and for weeks after, as the Allies, including Patton and the US Third Army, moved deeper and deeper into France, the Germans continued to hold on to Calais for dear life. It wasn't until Patton's real army began to prod them from the south that the panzers and infantry moved out, after they'd spent almost the whole summer waiting for an assault that never came from an army that didn't exist. At this point in the podcast, just a big thank you to all of those listeners who have provided feedback for the show, whether it be through Podcast Alley, iTunes or some other place on the internet. Remember, feedback is greatly appreciated. You can also provide feedback for the show via email if you wish, and my email address is paulrex at paulrex.com. Some kind people have also donated to the podcast in the last month or so, and I'd like to say a big thank you to these people. Lewis Kozasek. Thomas Krauss, uh, let me see, Martha Johnson, Daniel Saracini, uh, Richard Gaelli, I hope I said that correctly, Richard, April Curry, uh, Mary Brown, Ryan McCall, and Strikeability. Thank you everyone, your donations are greatly appreciated, and they do help to keep the show on the air. Thank you everyone. And from the www.unmuseum.org website, an article by Lee Christick. Heal Hitler. Did the Nazis really intend to create an army of talking dogs? At least one of them, according to reports, when asked, Who is Adolf Hitler? would reply, Mein Führer. Even so, were the Nazis, as some accounts claimed, really building an army of intelligent talking dogs to defend the Third Reich? Where did this story come from, and how much of it is actually true? The legend of the talking Nazi attack dogs isn't the only strange tale to surface after World War II. Various rumours have appeared over the years, suggesting the Nazis engaged in some outlandish weapons research, creating some unbelievably advanced technology. There was a report, for example, that the Germans had built flying saucers capable of supersonic flight. Another rumour tells us that they had a secret underground base in the Antarctic. A different account claims that they actually invented the atom bomb and tested it long before the Allies created the weapon of mass destruction. Part of the rumour was that after the German surrender, the United States captured two of the devices and used them on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Many of these tall tales do have a seed of truth in them, however. 
The Germans did design some disc-shaped aircraft, though none could fly faster than sound. They did have an atomic research program, but they never put the resources into it needed to successfully make an A-bomb. And of course they did actually build some advanced weapons that shocked their enemies. Supersonic rockets that would drop soundlessly on London, automated cruise missiles that could fly the English Channel, and jet fighters that could zoom rings around Allied aircraft. So why not intelligent, talking attack dogs? The story starts a decade before the war. In 1930, the School Asra was founded by Margarethe Schmidt in a large house just outside the town of Lutenburg, Germany. The name means Asra Talking School for Dogs. Asra herself was a very smart Great Dane that was the mother of five or six of the dogs in the school. Apparently at one point there was also a cat on the roster too. The Hundsrechtskuhl wasn't as much of a school as it was a trained animal show. Schmidt and her mother took the dogs around to different venues where they would perform. According to one child who saw the show in 1944, the animals could tell the time, describe people and correct misspellings. Though the dogs attempted to vocalise human words, they were apparently more successful with communicating by using a coded system of barks or ringing an electric bell a number of times to get their message across. The school provided Schmidt and her mother with some much needed income. According to Max Mueller, a veterinarian who had visited the school in 1942, Schmidt had contacted Hitler about using her dogs to entertain members of the German army and he had accepted the offer. It isn't clear, however, if any of these performances actually took place. We do know that Hitler was a dog lover, he had two German shepherds, Bondi and Bella, and it was a core Nazi belief that there should be a strong bond between man and nature. In fact, one of the odder quirks of the Nazi regime was its tough animal protection policies. As soon as the party came into power in 1933, it passed a law so that mistreating your pet could get you two years in the slammer. They also banned the force feeding of ducks to produce foie gras, something the French are still struggling over. Restrictions were likewise put into place so that any animals slaughtered for food were required to be put to death humanely. Apparently the Third Reich was particularly concerned about the fate of lobsters in some of Berlin's finer restaurants. Hitler himself was pictured to the German public as an avid animal lover. He didn't think much of hunting, which he termed to be murder, and was rumoured to be off again, on again, vegetarian. All this of course came from a group of people that during World War II would order the demise of at least six million human beings in death camps. The Nazis seemed much more concerned with the welfare of pets than people. The German interest in animal intelligence goes back long before the Nazis, however. In the early 1900s, Don the Speaking Dog became a sensation in the small German town of Theerhut. In 1905, at the tender age of six months, Don was apparently begging for scraps under the family dinner table when he was heard to say, Haben, Haben, which in German is want, want. He soon expanded his vocabulary to include Kutchen, cakes, a favourite food, and Ja for yes and Nein for no. It was said that he could even put together rudimentary sentences like hunger want cakes. According to a newspaper article, the dog had nice clear diction. The tone was not a bark or growl, but distinct speech, it said. Don made quite a bit of money for his master by performing in different venues around the area. Another dog that influenced German thinking on animal intelligence was Rolf, an Airedale Terrier. Paula Mokel of Mannheim owned the animal, and she claimed that he could communicate by tapping out letters with his paws. He was even smart enough to assign the highest number of taps to the least used letters. According to Mokel, Rolf was into poetry, mathematics, theology and philosophy. He even communicated in languages other than German. She also claimed that the dog had a sense of humour, and once asked a visiting noblewoman if she could wag her tail. Perhaps what was most endearing to the German public, however, was that Rolf said he wanted to join the army because he hated the French. One of the people impressed by these canine geniuses was Karl Krall. Krall was an eccentric jeweller who founded a research institute outside Munich in the early 1900s, 
to study the intelligence of animals. There they conducted various experiments, including one on the possibility of telepathy between humans and poodles. A surviving photo shows both man and beast with their head inside steel helmets, apparently an attempt to measure the mental radiation between the two minds. Kral also believed that horses could show great intelligence and owned one named Muhammad that supposedly could calculate the cubed roots of numbers. But did all this interest in animal intelligence actually turn into a real Nazi-funded program to develop smart dogs for military purposes? In 2011, Jan Bondesen, a Swedish-born rheumatologist, scientist and author, wrote a book called Amazing Dogs, a Cabinet of Canine Curiosities. In it, Bondesen singled out the Hornsprechskuhl Asra as an example of Nazi-sponded research into canine-human communications. Why, in a Germany where all money went towards the war effort, could such bizarre projects go ahead, if not supported by the Nazi regime, he asked. Bondesen, based on his research, believed that Hitler had ordered the SS to investigate the possibility of the training of the animals. He thought that they were probably intended to work with the SS or be used as guard dogs in concentration camps. However, relatives of the Hunsprech School's headmistress deny that she received support from the government. According to her nephew, Schmidt complained about difficulty in getting food for her dogs during the war because she was told she was not doing any scientifically notable training. Even Bonson admits that if there was any attempt to make a super dog for the war effort, nothing came of it. He said that despite much effort, there is no evidence it, the work, ever actually came to fruition and that the SS were walking around with talking dogs. Why weren't the Nazis able to get a talking canine core out of these mutts? Well, first of all, their vocal mechanisms weren't really optimal for producing human speech, but the more important factor was that their high intelligence was simply an illusion, an instance of overly eager animals trying to please their masters. And from the paranormal.about.com website, Sparrows as Death Messengers. My grandparents came to the US from Norway in pursuit of a better life, like so many other immigrants at the time. My mother and I sat at the kitchen table one day when I was about eight years old. We had a large bay window that overlooked our yard. A sparrow flew up to the window where we were sitting, coming inches from the glass, and just hovered fluttering its wings. But the strange thing was, the bird was actually making eye contact with my mother. My mother said in a frightened tone, Oh no, please go away. My mum turned away from the window, and the sparrow flew off. My mother then went on to say, When I was your age, your grandma and I were sitting just like we are now, and a sparrow flew up to the window and looked at us, and your grandmother said, Oh my, we are going to have a death in the family shortly. My mum went on to say her mother had told her that it was an old Norwegian omen, that when a death is about to occur, a sparrow will deliver to you the message via eye contact. Mum went on to say that she and her mum were on the patio one day, and the sparrow flew up and fluttered in front of my grandmum's face. My grandma began to cry and said, I don't want to lose anyone right now. My mum said, Would you believe grandma died two weeks later? I know this sounds like a silly superstition, but over the past 30 years, every time a sparrow does this, within two weeks someone close to me dies. When the sparrow does this, you know it's not some random bird. The sparrow will actually peck at the window to get your attention. It will behave in an unnatural manner of a wild animal. The bird will look you in the eyes. It will do whatever it takes to get your attention and then fly off. When I was in my early twenties, my boyfriend and I were cleaning his father's basement. They had a broken window down there, and they had just put some heavy plastic over it, 
until they could replace it. As we were cleaning, my boyfriend said, what is it with this crazy bird? I looked over and he was standing in front of the broken window and here was a sparrow in the window well, pecking at the plastic. My boyfriend poked the plastic back and the bird started poking more frantically. I yelled, get away from it. He then slapped the plastic with his hand and the sparrow stood there in the window well and just stared at him and then flew up and away. He said, that was one fearless bird. I told him, someone is going to die. That's an omen. He laughed at me, but one to one and a half weeks later, his uncle passed away. I could not count how many times this had happened over the years. Now when it does happen, I put a small S on the calendar because despite how many times it has occurred, I still find it unbelievable. But mark my word, a death always occurs shortly after these strange sparrow encounters. Back in 2008, I was washing dishes and, lo and behold, a sparrow came up to the window and made eye contact. I was sick. I knew that bizarre behaviour from this bird. That afternoon my kids were playing outside and they came barrelling into the house and slammed the door. My one girl said, Mum, there's a million birds on our roof. That's when I could hear them just squawking. People walking their dogs and doing yard work all stopped and just stared at my house. Ten days later, my mother passed away. My last experience was last fall. I woke to find my four chihuahuas going insane at the back glass sliding doors to the deck. The dogs were barking frantically at a sparrow standing on the other side of the glass, just staring in. The bird was not the least bit frightened by these ballistic dogs charging the glass. I ordered the dogs away. I squatted down and looked directly at the sparrow. I wondered if it was sick or injured. No, he was just standing strong, clear eyes, just staring at me. I waved my hand at it. Didn't flinch. I got afraid and closed the blinds. The sparrow stayed at the door for about three minutes and then flew off. About four days later I was outside raking leaves and my neighbour came and told me, my mother passed away yesterday. I couldn't believe it. I know some people are thinking coincidence, but honestly, how many times can it be a coincidence? Sparrows are everywhere and I understand that. But when these birds are here to deliver a message, their behaviour is not of a wild bird. It is truly abnormal and it leaves you knowing exactly why it was there. Well, everyone, that concludes episode 53 of the Mysteries Abound podcast, The Attack of the Nazi Talking Dogs. Hope you enjoyed today's show, and many thanks to those people who provided feedback or gave donations to the podcast since last time. Everything's back to normal here now. My wife's gone back to work, so I'm not getting all these little jobs around the place that are holding me up. So until next time, whether it be the Origins podcast, Bizarre Bizarre, or another Mysteries Abound, it's thank you, everyone, and... Bye for now.